Kia ora koutou katoa. Sorry for the delay. We've had um, a few technical difficulties. Welcome to the first webinar for the third engagement phase of From the Mountains to the Sea, the development of a new land and freshwater plan for the Tasman region. I'm Andrew Smith, and I'm facilitating this webinar on behalf of TDC. This engagement round focuses on the environmental outcomes that have been drafted to give effect to the visions and values that were developed after previous engagement rounds. All the information that we're going to cover in this webinar is available on Shape Tasman, and that's also where you can give us your feedback on the draft environmental outcomes we're going to cover. If you have anything you want clarified or questions that you want to ask, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. We'll answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. I'd like to introduce Lisa McGlinchey, Principal Planner, and Erin Hawke, Planner in the Environmental Policy Team at TDC, both of whom are working on From the Mountains to the Sea. Lisa's going to do the introductory part of the presentation, and then we'll hand over to Erin for the remainder. Over to you, Lisa. Thanks, Andrew. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep, great. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to give you a bit of a rundown around um, our process, just to give a, a bit of uh, context to this project um, and why it's so important that we receive your feedback uh, at this time. And then Erin will come through with a bit of a recap on uh, our output so far in the process for previous engagement um, and then go through um, our current round and the information that we've got online and the feedback we, that we'd like from you. Um, if you can just put through the next slide, Erin. So I'll just dive straight into our um, process overview. Keep going, next one. Um, so this whole project is looking at reviewing the freshwater parts of our Tasman Resource Management Plan. Um, this process started back in 2020. Um, each of our parts of the plan need to be reviewed at a minimum every 10 years. Um, but the, um, the plan change will also be looking to implement the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management that came out in 2020. Um, and the aims of this work is to give effect to Tamanul Te Wai, and I'll cover that in a little bit later, um, but also to provide for the values of water that we've been identifying. Um, and that may include either maintaining our water health or improving it where it's been degraded. Um, and it's also about reviewing how we share and manage our freshwater resources. So thinking about um, water permits, discharge permits, how we use the land and water and uh, the effect that it has on our environment. Um, one big thing that's happened since that review started is the resource management reform um, process. So the Resource Management Act um, was in the process of being replaced um, by a number of acts. Um, that process is now being affected by the change of government. Um, and so we're not sure where that's going to go yet um, until we actually see the government formed and, and they actually outline what their changes are. Um, but in terms of our process, what it has done is uh, originally the review was a whole of plan review. So we were looking at the entirety of the Tasman Resource Management Plan. Um, with that reform change um, and a directive that we were joining plans with Nelson, um, we've now paired that back to some very targeted plan changes, one of which is the freshwater, the land and freshwater plan. Um, so that's continuing to be progressed. Um, and we have a deadline in the RMA um, of a plan in December 2024. Um, obviously, with the change of government, there's still ongoing uncertainty there. So um, it's sort of a bit of a watch this space, unfortunately. Um, so in terms of one of the main concepts that, dri that is driving this plan change is Tamanul Te Wai, um, and within the National Policy Statement, there is a hierarchy of obligations. Um, our first obligation is to put the health of water bodies first. Um, the second obligation is the health needs of people. Erin, if you could just click through those next slot. Um, and the third is everything else, so our social, cultural, and economic well-being. Um, and I guess the, the message that we've heard from the National Party so far is that they will be looking to rebalance Tamanul Te Wai. We're not sure what that means at that, the stage. It could mean that they are going to change the hierarchy. Um, but I guess from our perspective, uh, almost regardless of which government um, is in control of the day and which legislation we're doing this under, uh, the freshwater issues will likely remain the same. Um, it's just the, the vehicle by which uh, we implement them might be a little bit different. 
Um, so there's an awful lot of national direction in the freshwater policy space. We've got uh, a couple of national policy statements, plus a whole raft of national environmental standards, which act like national rules. Um, but the main one that our focus is on is the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management. Um, it was first um, brought out in 2011, um, and the latest version in 2020 has had some significant changes. Um, and in particular, it identifies what we term the National Objective Framework Process, um, and this essentially outlines the process that council needs to follow to, um, to develop these plan changes. Um, there's seven main steps, um, and as you'll see from the diagram, we're at step four. So we've gone through and had a look at our freshwater management units. Those are the spatial areas where we're looking to apply um, our freshwater framework and rules. Um, we've looked at developing long-term visions for each of those freshwater management units um, and looked at the values of water, um, both from the national policy statement and the community. Um, and now we're at step four looking at the environmental outcomes. Um, so why get involved now? Uh, I guess the main um, message that we want to uh, for people to understand is that the visions and values that have been identified and the environmental outcomes will drive the rules that are in the plan. So they are setting our goals. Um, and so the plans will be required to seek to achieve those goals over time. Um, so it's quite important that we get those goals, that direction setting right. Um, and in particular, the environmental outcomes will be objectives, so goals within the regional plan. Um, those rules may affect water permits, discharge permits, but also any land use and activities that either generate discharges that might end up in water. Um, that's uh, surface water, so rivers, um, lakes, uh, wetlands, but also our groundwater, so our aquifers. Um, and also any activities and land uses that affect water bodies and their margins um, themselves. Um, so I guess just to um, give you an idea of the importance of the, the visions and the environmental outcomes, um, we're sort of basically going through a process of looking at what is our current state in each of our freshwater management units and what is our long-term vision for that. Um, are we in a maintained state? Are we happy with the way things are or do we actually want to improve things? Um, and if we are looking at improving things, it's asking that question of how much change is needed and to what aspects. Um, as well as over what timeframes. So the timeframes are going to be important. You know, we can't expect change to happen overnight. Um, in a lot of cases, some of our issues that we have are very complex. So we need to understand how long is it actually going to take us to get where we want to go. Um, and these exact same questions can be asked in the environmental um, outcome uh, space. So looking at our each of our values um, and their current state, um, and then looking at where we want to get them to in terms of the environmental outcome, how much change is needed to provide for that value, um, and again, what time frames, how long is it going to take to get us there. Um, and on the next slide, we've got a, just a bit of an example um, of human contact, um, so swimming and boating, that kind of thing, uh, immersion activities. Um, so we might ask ourselves, well, what's important for that? So it, it needs to be safe to swim so it doesn't make us sick. Uh, it's nice, it, it's uh, good if it's pleasant to swim in, otherwise um, we won't want to go there, um, and it also has to be accessible. So um, accessible has actually been, uh, public access has been identified as a specific value in its own right. Um, but the next thing we would look at is, well, what does what do those things mean? What do we need, actually need for those things to, to occur? So for being safe to swim, we're looking at bacterial pathogen levels, E. coli, but also what other discharges are going in that might uh, want to make it unsafe uh, to swim. In terms of being pleasant, you know, what the, how much algae is in the water, what's the water clarity like in terms of um, sedimentation, um, and access we might be looking at, you know, is there actual public access, are there public facilities? Um, and in terms of how that might end up influencing the plan, um, in terms of keeping things safe to swim, we might look at rules for effluent managed to make effluent management, sorry, to make sure that uh, e. coli levels are, are kept within safe levels. We might also have non-regulatory approaches and rules for co other contaminant discharges. Um, in terms of managing things like algae, water clarity and sediment, we might have rules for land disturbance to make sure that we're not getting excess sediment coming off um, land use activities. And we also might have rules for nutrient management, um, particularly on farm. And it's not all about the rules in the plan. There are non-regulatory approaches we might use. So that could include things like providing education and advocacy, um, resources, works and services done by the council, financial um, subsidies for community groups and, and landowners to be doing work as well. 
Uh, next slide, thanks, Erin. Oh, this is straight in. So that's that's basically a, um, a summary of sort of the process to date um, and why it's so important that we need the feedback on the environmental outcomes. Um, and now I'll hand over to Erin to give us a recap on the output so far from our engagement processes. Thanks. Oh, kia ora koutou. Yes, so we started with our freshwater management units and as Lisa said, that's our catchment areas. Uh, we identified eight of those across the uh, top of the south here. Um, yeah, you'll see we've got Aorere West Coast, Takaka, Abel Tasman, Kaitiri, Motuweka, Rewaka, Apabola, Kawatiri, uh, Motiri, Waimea and the uh, deep groundwater, which is on the next slide. Um, yeah, so they're based on our surface water catchment areas and our coastal receiving environments, and they include uh, groundwater as well. So you'll see here that there's some uh, freshwater management zones. These are the sub catchments within those larger freshwater management areas and we'll be looking at allocation regimes potentially at that uh, lower level within each of the freshwater management units. These maps are available online um, so you can just go to our main webpage Tasman District Council website and just you can put FMU in the search bar and they'll come up um, or you can press on the link in this uh, recording. I'll just add to that, Erin, um, they're also, you can actually download the actual GIS layer if you do have access to a GIS system, or you can actually view it um, in ArcGIS online, which um, is free to download, so then you can have a, a real look and a, a play with the, the draft layers. Yeah, and we're not seeking feedback on these at the moment, but um, if, if you do have anything, we're also uh, happy to hear your thoughts, and you can email us that directly. Um, and there's our freshwater plan email address there. And the other thing, oh, yep. Sorry, Erin, I will just um, to note that there is some quite complex zoning in some of our catchments, particularly our Tarkaka Freshwater Management Unit and the Waimea. Um, and those are essentially because there's quite complex groundwater in those freshwater management units. Um, and so the, the zoning is, is based on those um, groundwater levels. So, um, it, it, is, it does consider the linkage between surface and groundwater, um, as well as um, the different management focuses that need to be in each of those zones. Um, particularly for water permit holders, it may end up being that depending on which of the water bodies they take from, they'll be affected by a, a different water management zone and its, its associated rules and potentially more than one zone. Thanks, Erin. Great, thanks, Lisa. Uh, the other thing we've also consulted the community with is our long-term visions and that's from our first two rounds of engagement at the end of last year and earlier this year and we drafted up some visions um, after our first round and put those back out for further feedback in our second round and we've done some more work on those and if you want to see that we've got some information on, our, on Shape Tasman, just go to the previous engagement there and you can read all about it. So our vision for Waimea, this is an example of one of the, the visions and you'll see that it's a common vision and we've decided that a lot of the FMUs have a lot of commonality and so we've developed um, some themes to look at the commonalities across all the FMUs and we've also put some timeframes on those because we had some feedback that people wanted to know when these things were going to happen. And the blue writing you'll see is um, specific to the Waimeas. So for the Waimeas, you know, obviously the nitrate levels improving along with the health of the aquifers and the spring fed streams that came through quite strongly in the feedback. And the Waimea Inlet, making sure that's teeming with bird life in the future. So that's helped us with the next step, which was the values. And so the values are driven mostly out of the National Policy Statement for Fresh Water, which the government's directed us to do. So there's four compulsory values, ecosystem health, and that's broken down into five uh, 
other aspects, so water quality and water quantity, they're really important, and habitat, aquatic life and ecological processes are also important. Um, human contact is another compulsory value along with mahinga kai and threatened species. And we are also required to develop an environmental outcome for each of the values. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail later on. The other national values that we're required to consider are natural form and character, drinking water supply, waitapu, so places where rituals and ceremonies are performed and where spiritual significance uh, is important for tangata whenua. Transport and tauranga waka, so landing places and launching places for waka and navigability of our waterways, so not obstructing them with anything, unless that's the more important value. Uh, hydroelectricity, so your microhydro fishing, that's your recreation angling, irrigation cultivation, production of food and beverages, so yep, your hops and your vineyards, that's important. Drinking water and commercial industrial use. So the community also identified four other values that were important that were outside of the ones identified at the national level and that these are public access, aggregate resources, resilience to climate change and kaitiakitanga and stewardship. So the aggregate is obviously being able to get um, gravel from our rivers for the building and construction and roading industry and you know farmers wanting it for their tracks and things that came through as being important to our community. Resilience to climate change, there was really two aspects to that. One was the resilience of water bodies themselves to climate change, so being able to have enough wetlands to absorb water and and having rivers with enough areas to be able to put the flood water, take out some of the en energy, prevent erosion, and also the resilience of us to things like drought, so you know having water storage on farms and things. Uh, Kaitiakitanga stewardship, that was also a really strong community value. And you'll see the, the photo here, that's uh, the Motupupi River and a restoration project carried out under the name Mr. Werp, Motupupi River Wetland Ecological Restoration Programme, which the school children were involved with and it was driven by council and community land care research. Obviously, that's outside of our plan rules when, we, when we're working with community groups like that, but it's also really important for us to work in those areas as well. So this is the process so far. We've identified our freshwater management units. We've got our draft long-term visions. We've identified our values for water, and now we're working on environment, environmental outcomes. So this is where the rubber hits the road for us in our engagement around this um, this time round, and as I said before, we have to identify an environmental outcome for each of the values, um, water, and we've got 21 environmental outcomes. So five of those are our ecosystem health factors, and the other 16 are the values I've just talked about. Um, those outcomes are begun at are going to become new objectives in the Tasman Resource Management Plan. So we'll be replacing some of our old objectives and we'll be adding some new ones. Um, and that's where we want your feedback through Shape Tasman. And I'll just run you through that now, what that looks like. So when you go into our website, um, you'll see there's a, a number of outcomes. There's 21 of them. Obviously, there's a lot of information there. You might not want to contribute to each outcome, but you can just uh, scroll through and pick the ones that are most important to you. This is outcome six for human contact, and it says water quality is safe for human contact. The healthy Māori and natural aesthetics and amenity of water bodies support recreational use and enjoyment of water through a range of activities. And that's fine if you agree, and, and if not, you can disagree and you'll get a, um, a box where you can put a detailed answer in. So you might just say, look, it's too full of jargon. We really don't like the word aesthetics. Can you change the wording? Or you might have something altogether different. We also are really keen to hear if you want the environment, environmental outcome to be specific to an FMU, because we've just taken them at quite high level as applying mostly to across all of the FMUs. So an example of this might be 
I want to be able to swim in Lake Kalani and see the clear, clear to the bottom again. That might be important to you, and that's something we have heard through engagement to date. Uh, the other thing important here is the value description. So if you're wondering what this environmental outcome relates to, it relates to the value, and there's a description of the value there. So I'll run through a couple of other examples. So Mahinga Kai, um, this is outcome seven, and it says indigenous ecosystems and biodiversity are thriving, providing abundant Mahinga Kai food and resource gathering. Mahinga Kai resources are safe to harvest and eat. They're accessible to tangata whenua for customary use, and communities can transfer knowledge about traditional practices for the next generation. And there you'll see the value description. So it's important to recognise that Mahinga Kai is not just about gathering resources, it's about transferring that knowledge and and doing it in a way that, that's respectful. Aggregate resources, this is uh, one of the community values again. It says here, aggregate resources within water bodies and their margins or overlying aquifers are managed to support economic and social opportunities for people, businesses and industries, except where ecosystem health, human health needs, natural character or cultural values may be adversely affected. Um, and that's just recognising that affordable aggregate is important for local roads and affordability developments and housing, things like that. But at the same time, we also have to think about how we manage the river because its stability in a flood situation is important and also the ecology as well. We don't want to lose that. And this is the last outcome that we've got uh, available on the website. It's Kaitiakitanga Stewardship. Our water bodies have a healthy Māori and are cared for and respected by our communities. People maintain strong relationships with water bodies and their margins. The use of land and water and catchment resources is recognised as a privilege. Communities are enabled to be guardians, giving back to catchments to ensure they are healthy for future generations. And again, you'll see that's the Mr Work project there in Motopipi, which I've spoken about before. So I think just one or two more slides. This is, um, here's where we want your feedback. This is our Mountains to the Sea page and we are asking for your feedback until the 30th of November. Then we're going to close it and we're going to analyse it in December. In January, we're going to provide a feedback report. That's the plan. And then we're going to head into our next round of engagement for March, which we're hoping to do on attributes. So how we're going to measure water quality and quantity to meet these environmental outcomes that the community has identified as being important. Um, we're happy to speak to any community groups that want us to talk to their members and we're happy for you to email us directly at freshwaterland at tasman.govt.nz if you prefer to do that or you have something else you wish to add. And I'll just add, Erin, that um, if, if you want to know any more information about the wider plan development process itself, we have a, a separate page on Tasman's um, Tasman Council's website, if you just put in land and freshwater plan change, it should come up and then that will give you all the background to this process so far. Thank you very much for that, Erin and Lisa. Very informative. So just wanted to reinforce that all this information is available on Shape Tasman, and that's also where you can provide your feedback. Um, we haven't really had any questions come in from many people yet. So if anybody's got any questions about anything that we've covered in this presentation, you can use the Q&A function to ask that question and then we'll answer that for you. So um, if anyone's got a question, they can do that now. Otherwise, we, otherwise we'll um, leave you to head over to Shape Tasman and um, follow up on some of this. Well, there's no questions coming in, so I think we'll leave it there. Um, actually, now there's a couple of questions. Hang on a second. Um, let's just have a quick look. So we've got one question here, which um, you might be able to answer, Lisa. Um, how do you handle the tensions between different values? And an example that they've given is um, 
threatened species versus fishing? Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> and I think it's it's one of the challenges that we have in the freshwater management space because there are um, values that often can conflict. Um, and we have had feedback from the community on this one. So in particular, in terms of that example, we have had some people identify, you know, that they consider trout to be a pest species and they would like them gone, thank you. Um, and then we have um, other people who value them in terms of their, um, their recreational fishing um, value as well as tourism and would like to see them protected. Um, for Tasman in particular, we actually do have two water conservation orders, one on the Buller, one on the uh, Motueka River, um, that actually seek to protect trout habitat. Um, so it is actually a recognised uh, value in, in that respect in Tasman already. Um, I think also the, the realistic aspect of actually removing an entire species is, is um, known and possible, I think. Um, but I think there is certainly things that we can do um, in terms of protecting the indigenous species, the indigenous fish species. Um, I think a key, key thing there is the improving the habitat side of things. We've had a lot of lowland um, habitat loss in terms of some of our water bodies, um, in particular the spawning sites, so not just the Inanga spawning sites near the coast, but also the other galaxid species that make up sort of the, the white bait group, so our giant kokapu, things like that, that actually breed in slightly different places. So understanding where those are and providing protection for those, providing more habitat, um, refuges during drought and during floods. So there's a, there's a lot we can do on, on both sides, I think. Um, and I guess that's that's the the key is in those challenges where we do have values that might be slightly conflicting is to actually understand what are the things that we can do that can achieve gains in, in all the values without necessarily having them affecting each other. But it's certainly, um, it'll be part of the conversation over the next 12 months in terms of the plan development process about how we actually go about that. There's another question coming, which is um, on a similar sort of topic, and that is how do fish values get separated from ecosystem health? Fish are part of the ecosystem. Um, it's not so much that they're separated, it's just a, it's a, a part of the consideration. So ecosystem health has been split up into those five factors, um, but they don't operate in isolation, obviously. Um, in terms of the, the fish component, it varies much part of the aquatic uh, life aspect. Um, but there's also, you know, we have to make sure that the water quality is um, appropriate for um, providing for the fish species that we have. Um, water temperature is a really key one, and that one sort of blends in not, in not only just water quality, but also the habitat. It's really important to have shaded uh, water bodies. Um, so it's not a, it's not so much that they're, that they're separated as much as it's just making sure that we're considering all of the components that are required for ecosystem health. Right. Thank you for that, Lisa. Um, another question that we've had is what sort of exam what's an example of the sort of regulations that might come out of this process? Um, so we've got a, a, a toolbox of policy responses. Um, obviously, these environmental outcomes will be objectives in the plan. So the objectives are essentially the, the goals for the plan over time. Um, sitting underneath those are uh, our policies, which are the how we are going to implement those objectives. Um, and then under those are the rules. Um, so the rules determine what activities are, require consent. Um, and the objectives and the, the policies help inform our decision makers on whether those consents should be granted or not. Um, so the whole framework is quite important um, in terms of the rule sets. Um, you know, we might see shifts in what we consider to be permitted activities, um, what requires consent and what level of consent we're, we're seeking. Um, there are also maybe changes in terms of the information that we're being, uh, that we're seeking from consent applications. Um, and there may be specific controls. So we might look at changes in controls to um, our discharge levels and what is um, considered to be acceptable in some places. Uh, we'll also see some change in terms of our water allocation as well. So one of the things that the national policy statement requires us to do is to have an allocation limit and a minimum flow for um, the water bodies in our freshwater management units. So we already have a lot of those in the plan, um, but we'll be extending those to all the areas that haven't in the past. 
Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a raft of changes. Um, as I said earlier, um, they're likely to affect our water permitting, um, our discharge permitting, and also looking at land use activities that, are, that generate discharges or affect water bodies directly. So that might include things like removing vegetation along water bodies and the activities that can be done in water bodies in their margins. Thanks for that. Um, we had a question come in about whether the Roding River has a minimum flow rate, and I know that the upper catchment of the Roding is managed by Nelson City Council rather than Tasman, um, but it sounds like under this process a lot of the, the rivers and streams will end up with minimum flow rates. Would that be correct? Uh, yes, it does. So um, the slide that we showed earlier that showed the water management zones, that's the um, sort of the spatial area at which we'll be setting those allocation limits. Um, we are working very closely with both Nelson and Marlborough um, in terms of our discussions across water management um, being consistent across the top of the south. But we are working closely with Nelson as well um, in terms of their process. Obviously, the, the top part of the roading where they take their water supply as part of the Waimea uh, catchment. Um, likewise, the, the Stoke um, FMU on the Nelson side also flows into the Waimea Inlet. Um, and so when we've looked at our freshwater management units, we've sought to group them by the coastal receiving environment as well so that we can look at um, making sure that we've got integrated management from the mountains to the sea. Um, so, yeah, I'd, 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 I'd have to have a look actually at where the minimum flow is at in terms of what Nelson has done in the roading. Um, it's, I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's certainly something that we're looking at in terms of making sure that the frameworks are aligned for those parts of catchments that are across the council boundaries. Yep, thank you. Um, another question here, which is quite topical. Will the outcomes affect the allocation for those invested in the Waimea Dam? Uh, Short answer is no. Um, so those allocations have been set previously and we'll be looking to bring those forward into the new plan. Uh, what will change in the new plan is hopefully that whole framework will get a lot more simple. So it's been a very complex uh, framework to implement and understand um, because of the, the position when the original plan was written about whether we were going to have a dam or no dam. So there's three different scenarios and they're currently a, a no dam with dam before dam. Um, so with the dam um, likely to be coming online in 2024, I would expect the new plan will be um, simplified down to the with dam scenario. Um, and that should actually hopefully simplify a lot of those water management zones and make it a lot more clearer and easier to go through the plan and understand where things are at. Um, with the dam coming online, it will um, enable more water to be taken in those affiliated areas um, to make use of the stored water. Um, but we will also still have our, the unaffiliated framework um, for those permits who aren't affiliated to the dam, which have a different management regime within those areas. Great, thank you. Um, another question here. What work are you doing in degraded habitats? Will you map these and report on these in your background reports? <laughs> Um, so in terms of the that sort of out of scope in terms of the, the plan change that we're looking at, although the plan will be seeking to enable uh, restoration works and make sure that there's um, you know, minimal red tape for those things going ahead. Uh, but we do have other um, departments and council who look after that and they do have uh, catchment enhancement uh, projects going on. We have mapped those um, and I think they are available on uh, Tasman's website. Um, we also now have a team of catchment facilitators um, who each have a couple of uh, freshwater management units under their wing um, who will be looking at working and growing our relationships with community groups and landowners in those areas to help facilitate some of those projects going forward. Great. Um, got a nice simple question here, but I'm guessing the answer isn't going to be nice and simple. Will this get cows out of rivers? <laughs> Uh, no, but so there's a there's a, a national piece of regulation, uh, the stock exclusion regulations that do just that. Um, so the plans don't necessarily need to go there. Um, those kicked in in 2020, but they had a, a sort of a programmed rollout, um, and I think the last rollout is in 2025. So we would expect by then you would see stock, particularly um, cattle, deer. Um, to be excluded from water bodies. Um, so there is the 
the potential for the plan could look at more stringency than that regulation in terms of setback distance and things like that and potentially other stocks. So at the moment, those stock exclusion regulations don't include sheep, um, generally because they don't like going near water. Uh, but there are some known issues with sheep access to water bodies in terms of them camping underneath uh, riparian vegetation for the shade and creating sediment issues. Um, and also potentially sort of shedding of things like Campylobacter, which has been a, a health risk elsewhere. So um, it is stuff that we're looking at, but primarily in terms of getting cattle out of the rivers, the, the stock exclusion regulations should be um, kicking in over the next few years. Yeah, and um, on a related topic, how does this work all fit in with what's already being done in terms of on-farm water plans? Uh, so the freshwater farm plans, uh, I'm assuming that that's, that's um, going through. So those are building on a lot of um, existing freshwater envir uh, farm environment plan work that farmers have already been doing. Um, we're expecting the regulations, if they remain the same under the national government, um, or the coalition, I should say, um, if they remain the same, we're expecting that to apply in the Tasman uh, region from January 2025. Um, so each of the farms that meet the threshold will require to have a freshwater farm plan. Um, and there's actually a link between the freshwater farm plan process and the plan. So um, we have to generate what's called a catchment context. Uh, there's a longer name for it, but I'll leave it there for now, um, which identifies the issues in each freshwater management unit and all, that will tie to the vision and the values and the environmental outcomes that we're um, looking at developing through this process. So those will go into the catchment context and the freshwater farm plans need to have regard to those catchment contexts when they're being developed. So it helps the farmers understand how their farm relates to their catchment um, and the kind of goals that their catchment is trying to seek so that they can align their farm plan to help target the key issues in their particular catchment. Right, thank you. And I think one last question. Um, which is what's the difference between mahinga kai and fishing? Um, personally, I would say that fishing sort of a bit of a subset of mahinga kai. Mahinga kai is quite a broad concept in terms of it being uh, food gathering, but also materials and other things as well. Um, I think they've separated out fishing in the national uh, policy statement because there is a recognised recreational fishing um, aspect in terms of the trout and salmon um, fisheries. Um, so I think that's sort of the, the focus on that. I mean, it can obviously still include fish that is taken for, um, to be eaten. Um, but the fishing one is, is targeted at those species that are allowed to be caught and eaten. Um, so that's not something that council has specific control over in terms of the, um, the species management. But certainly in terms of providing for that value, um, that's what our focus is to make sure that the water bodies are, are healthy and, um, and those values are provided for. Thank you very much. Um, we haven't got any more questions that have come in. So if everyone's happy with that, I think we'll leave the question and answer session there. Um, again, don't forget that all the information that we've gone over today is available on the From the Mountains to the Sea section of Shape Tasman. And that's also where you can go to fill in some surveys to give us your feedback on the environmental outcomes that we've drafted. So thank you very much for attending this webinar. Um, if you do end up with questions that you want to ask, we're running two more webinars. Um, you can find the details of those on the From the Mountains to the Sea area in Shape Tasman. And you're welcome to attend those and ask more questions if you want. But other than you that, can also e you can also email us at the freshwater plan at tasman.govt.nz. Um, That's on the screen there and we can answer those as well. That's right. Yes. And as Erin said, we are more than happy to attend um, any meetings that organisations or community groups are having if you think that they would benefit from some discussion around the development of the plan. So have a good afternoon. Thank you very much for attending and um, we'll see you over at Shape Tasman. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Kakite.